Elizabeth Fitchner is the farm advisor for Tulare. Um, she works for UC Cooperative Extension. And today she's going to be talking about understanding and mitigating alternate bearing in olives. Thanks so much um, for inviting me to talk. Um, Cindy, I'll be presenting work on alternate bearing. Um, I did listen to Louise's talk earlier. And so I, at first I thought, oh no, she's covering alternate bearing. And then I realized, no, some of this stuff is so heavy that it's so beneficial to hear the message multiple times and also um, delivered in different ways. I've been specifically researching alternate bearing in olives in collaboration with Dr. Carol Lovett, a professor at UC Riverside. She also works on alternate bearing. Um, that's a very specific part of her program and she works on it in avocado and mandarin orange. So um, the work that we've conducted is, um, has been funded by the California Olive Committee. So all of our studies have been conducted on the Manzanillo olive, the traditional cultivar used for table olives here in California. So in, in California, the current um, picture of olives is we're at about 45,000 acres. And um, in 2021, according to the National Ag Statistics, olives were ranked 48th in California based on gross value. And that was out of a total of 70 commodities ranked. That's pretty incredible when you think it's being compared to dairy and um, you know these major nut crops, et cetera. So, you know, olives do rank really, they're a big contributor to our economy in California. And if we look at the gross um, value, they're at about $158 billion. 75% um, of that value came from just five counties, Tehama, Glen, Tulare, Yolo, and San Joaquin. And we look at, if we look at just the total acreage, Tulare County, where I am, is, has the most acreage of olives, but 80% of the acreage do come from the same five counties, Tehama, Glen, Tulare, Yolo, and San Joaquin. One thing that you'll notice here, and this is the production in Tulare County, if we look at the, um, the blue line, that is our total acreage. And we've had about, um, half of our acreage, uh, mostly table olives, has disappeared in the last 20 years. So we've had a reduction in the total acreage. However, our production isn't grossly affected and that's partly due to the efficiencies of production and higher maintenance of yield per acre. However, if you look here at the green bars, that is the total production and you can see it can oscillate dramatically from one year to the next. So for example, I remember the harvest in 2010. We were out there harvesting table olives well into November and our yields were tremendously high. But what happened was that the, the year prior, we had terrible heat at bloom in 2009. And so we had a crop failure in 2009, specifically because of the heat at bloom. Since it's a Manzanillo um, table olive growing region, that heat in, at bloom reduced the fertilization of manzanillo because it can self fertilize, but when there's heat, the pollen tube is not able to self. So this oscillation in production is very dramatic. And one of the other problems with it for table olive, olives is that in years where we have high production, like in 2010, we can have a tremendous amount of small fruit. And of course, we can have large fruit in the years with low production. These oscillations result in huge differences in production from year to year, and of course, a huge impact on the value of the table olive industry. This is all caused by the phenomenon known as alternate bearing. And this has been touched upon certainly by Louise earlier today. And this is the tendency for trees to produce fruit in these two year cycles. And for olives, this is a, a really big problem. Um, it's a challenge to both the growers and the processors alike. There's an inconsistent supply of fruit and it's very difficult to budget 
um, for the for management of um, your crop from one year to the next. And it's unpredictable, it's an unpredictable situation that's perpetuated by mechanisms within the tree. And that's what I'm going to talk about is those mechanisms, because it's slightly different than in other crops. There's similarities and then there's differences. So alternate alternate bearing is initiated by factors that either limit or promote crop. So for example, climate is one of the major um, predictors of crop bloom. Adverse conditions at bloom or fruit set can um, dramatically impact the crop. Um, cold, freeze damage, and also stress prior to bloom. Stress prior to bloom in about February can affect the number of um, flowers that contain female flower parts. And that's yet another issue for olives. Secondly, um, the management of crop load, failure to thin. A lot of growers, um, more so in the Sacramento Valley than down here, um, will use NAA to thin, um, thin the crop after fruit set. Um, over thinning with NAA can strip the trees of fruit completely. And that'll cause an extreme off year. Another thing we've seen is harvest management, failure to harvest at all, leaving um, fruit on the trees, maybe because it's not economical. Olives are kind of unique botanically in that they have what's called flower dimorphism, okay? They're called andromonoecious. They have her hermaphroditic flowers that have male and female flower parts. But under some conditions, particularly stress conditions, about eight to 10 weeks prior to bloom, a fraction of the female flower parts may abscise, resulting in male flowers. This isn't a really big problem because olives are wind pollinated. So there, there's gonna be plenty of pollen um, to go around to, to pollinate the crop. This concept from an evolutionary perspective um, is considered to be beneficial to the plant so that they can they don't put too much energy um, into um, producing a huge number of fruits, but rather they put out a lot of pollen and then hope to um, support the successful reproduction of a, fruit, a few fruits. So that's one of, the, one of the reasons we can have alternate bearing in olives is because if you have stress prior to bloom, we might have a predominance of male flowers. And of course, the male flowers do not produce fruit. So this is an example of um, two photos within the same, the same orchard. Um, on one side, you see shot berries, those little tiny pellets. And on the right, a, a successful um, crop. This is just a dis difference in fertilization. Um, the tree that had all those shot berries, the shot berries actually had, had flowers and they had female flower parts. It was just um, a failure in fertility. So we didn't have basically the introduction of the male um, haplotype to fertilize the female flower in that case. And this is one of those things that can dramatically um, affect fruit production in olives from one year to another. So with shot berries, this is really a fertilization failure and it tends to happen when there's heat at bloom. So this is not, to, this has nothing to do with an abundance of staminate flowers. But when we have a tremendous amount of shot berries or no fruit on a tree, it can really um, start the extremes of this alternate bearing cycle. And in Louise's talk, she had shown that it can take several years for this alternate bearing cycle to really become established. That's true in other crops like pistachio. The first few years of production, you can, the crop load might seem even, but then those, those alternate bearing swings can set in. Um, within olives, it starts with an off year's vegetative growth. And in each of the axles of those leaves, a flower bud is formed. And flower bud initiation, that whole process of floral development starts around July. The following year, those flower buds will flower and then a fraction of them will set fruit. So in the next year, we have a, a bunch of fruit that's produced, but very little vegetative growth because that fruit actually inhibits the vegetative growth. 
So that's how we end up with these swings of one year with a lot of fruit and very little vegetative fruit growth. And then the following year, during an off year, you have vegetative growth and perhaps just a few fruit. And this cycle goes on and on unless it's reset by a weather event, for example, or a stress event. So alternate bearing in, in olives is a real problem for the industry. And you end up with these extremes of a low yield in an off crop year, followed by a high yield in an on crop year. This affects the supply of olives in a very dramatic way. We can have 50,000 tons one year to 160,000 tons the next. There's economic consequences to this. And a late harvest from an on-crop tree, from the on-crop to increase fruit size and oil content exacerbates the problem. So for oil olives, for example, since they're harvested <clears throat> when they're mature and the oil production and oil content goes up as the fruit ripen, you can have even more alternate bearing in oil olives than you would have in a table olive system simply because in table olives, we harvest when they are physiologically immature. Typically, this alternate bearing cycle is initiated by climatic events that will negatively impact flowering or fruit set. But once it's initiated, it is perpetuated by mechanisms within the plant. And that's what Carol Lovett and I have been working on together for probably about 12 years now. So again, once Alternate bearing is initiated, is perpetuated by the plant. And here are some of the examples. These are mechanisms by which the on crop, so that's the fruit, contribute to alternate bearing of manzanillo table olive. First, and I've just mentioned this, it inhibits summer vegetative shoot growth. This reduces the number of nodes that are present. And those nodes are the positions for flower bud development. It also inhibits floral development. So you get fewer flower buds that form. It inhibits spring bud break. So in other words, there are flower buds that will be present, but actually never bloom. We figured this out using plant growth regulators that would actually push some of those flowers to bloom so that we could count them. And it also causes abscission of floral buds. So we have one factor that affects vegetative growth and three factors that are affecting floral um, growth. We utilized experimental strategies to investigate the mitigation of alternate bearing in olive. The first was, can we enhance vegetative shoot growth in the summer? Can we produce more nodes for flower buds? The second was, can we increase floral bud break, push those flower buds to open? And the third is, can we reduce floral bud abscission? The steps that we used to ask these questions were to first model the tree phenology. We determined the timing of the fruit's impact on floral bud development and tested summer and spring plant growth regulator treatments. Those plant growth regulator treatments were designed to either push vegetative shoot growth in the summer or to enhance that return bloom, basically forcing some of those flower buds to actually open that otherwise would have been inhibited from opening in the spring. So the first set of studies that we did were um, a crop removal study. So we took on trees, and remove crop sequentially, say each month, to determine at what point was the crop uh, inhibiting the vegetative growth and the return bloom. And uh, this data represents the crop removal studies and the effect on shoot growth. And to make things simple, I'll explain that removing the crop by June was um, essential for allowing for vegetative shoot growth in the summer, or sorry, beyond July. Once we get to July, that fruit was inhibiting vegetative shoot for the, the current year, which would then impact the successive year. We did this by counting nodes, looking at shoot growth on flagged uh, branches throughout this study. 
We also looked at the impact of the fruit on return bloom and similarly found that by July, the fruit was inhibiting uh, the return bloom in the following year. We used plant growth regulator studies, injecting plant growth regulators in the tree to see if we could increase vegetative shoot growth in the summer and if we could um, push the bloom or the inflorescence intensity in, in the spring at bloom. We did this um, at different timings using randomized complete block designs. And we did find that these plant growth regulators when injected into the tree, there were plenty of treatments that had a positive benefit to vegetative growth. And I've mapped them out for what, what treatments were statistically significant. There's a big but here. Okay, all of these studies were done using tree injections. Okay, that's like what we call in science a proof of concept strategy, where we did this the way you would to get to address the physiology of the tree. But when we translated these trunk injection studies to a foliar spray application, to basically mimic what a commercial grower could do in an orchard we found that it was very difficult to achieve the same results that we could with trunk injections. And trunk injections certainly are not going to be uh, a viable um, operation on a commercial basis. So more research would be required to find a commercial application of some of these plant growth regulator treatments that we found to have a benefit for alternate bearing. That said, there are still options available for managing crop load. The first one, and I borrowed this from um, Bill Kruger. Um, he is a farm advisor emeritus who did extensive work on olives up in Glen County. Um, so one option, and this has been used a lot in the Sacramento Valley, less so down here in the Southern San Joaquin, is the application of naphthalene acetic acid after fruit set. Okay, in, in this situation, you either, either time your applications of NAA based on fruit size or days after bloom. The reason it's utilized as a technique more often in the Sacramento Valley than down here is because they don't get that heat that we have so soon after bloom. You know, down here, heat's a big issue. And it can be kind of dangerous if you use NAA and it gets really hot within a couple of days after applying the NAA, you could fry the crop off. And so that's a, a real problem. So it is a risky business. Timing is critical. Usually um, you do this when the fruit, they're little tiny um, fruit around one eighth to three sixteenths of an inch. Either that or you time the application of NAA based on days after full bloom. And I've pasted some of the results of Bill Kruger's work here. Um, he mentioned that 96 ounces of NAA per acre is common. Sequential sprays three to five days after the first one can have additive thinning effect. It's effective on both Manzanillo and Seviano. Tank additives are not necessary and the response related to post-treatment temperature and timing, and you just spray timing accordingly. And that's really the main reason why down here in the Southern San Joaquin growers are quite hesitant to use this technique. Another thing is that one could use pruning for crop management. Now this has been long discussed. However, our recent research kind of helps elucidate the mechanisms by which um, pruning can be useful for crop management and also the timing. So the timing is, is important. The pruning really needs to be completed by June. That is because pit hardening and the initiation of floral development occurs in July. So why is this early summer, mid-June timing best for pruning? And the reason is after you prune, you'll get a flush of new vegetative growth. And that new vegetative growth will produce a bunch of gibber gibberellins, a plant growth re regulator. Those plant growth regulators can inhibit floral bud de development. So if you're pruning in order 
to promote crop the following year, you certainly don't want to do it at a time when your pruning operation may inhibit floral bud development. Hence, if we now know that floral bud development occurs at about the same time as pit hardening, which is in July, that means you wanna have that pruning done much earlier so that th that flush of gibberellins is not in the tree at the same time as floral bud development is initiated. Um, another reason why um, pruning um, after fruit set is beneficial is a grower has the opportunity to assess the crop load before making any decision. And last, one of the other benefits of the summer prune, pruning or very late spring pruning is it's a low risk for disease transmission. And when I say that, I'm really thinking mostly about olive knot disease because it's a bacterial plant pathogen and it spreads um, in rainwater. Um, so pruning to manage crop load is certainly a multi-year strategy. And Louise touched upon this in her talk. And now I'm also going to um, bring in some of the work that we've done. I've made the schematic of an on tree and on either side of the tree, you can see the heavy crop load. In year one, your goal would, to be, would be to prune one side of the tree. This would be in June, remember. After pruning that crop, crop off, you would get summer vegetative growth that will provide the nodes or the sites for the future crop in the following year. But you'll retain the branches on the other side of the tree and that will um, give you the fruit bearing branches in the current season. In year two, you should end up with an intermediate crop. Now you might ask, why don't you get a huge crop on this left side of the tree? And that's because within olives, we have a whole tree effect of alternate bearing, but also, also a branch level effect. So all of the crop that had been born on the right side of the tree last year would still have a slight inhibitory effect even on the other side of the tree. Okay, so in year two, you have intermediate fruit production on the left side of the tree, and then the vegetative growth will continue on the right side of the tree. But in this year, year two, you're not pruning, okay? So again, this is one of those things where the pruning strategy is more of an every other year, every other side of the tree concept. In year three, you're gonna end up with intermediate fruit production on the left side of the tree, and then again on the right, even though it might pain you to cut some crop off, you will cut and prune on that right side of the tree. And again, get that summer vegetative growth on the right side of the tree. This vegetative growth will not be as impeded by the intermediate fruit load on the left. And in year four, you should end up with an intermediate crop load on either side of the tree, and you will not be pruning in year four. Now, as we move into the future, we're trying to develop a decision-making tool to determine the ongoing crop management techniques to be used in olive. Current research projects involve evaluation of flower thinning on sectors of the tree. Now remember, I just mentioned that Bill Kruger did a tremendous amount of work on fruit thinning. So one of the techniques that we're now looking at is flower thinning. Can we spray NAA on half of the tree or sectors of the tree to strip off the flowers before we get fruit set? And then basically move the crop from one side of the tree to the other using a chemical thinning, but a thinning of flowers, not fruit. It's a similar idea, but just a different timing. We're evaluating the use of liquistic for flower removal. So this is a project that's currently underway. We're cooperating with um, a, lo a local grower cooperator who's also a labor contractor. And so they're doing all of our control treatments in terms of the um, commercial standard for pruning trees, et cetera. So in summary, there are actually four 
documented mechanisms for alternate bearing in olive. We have impeded vegetative growth, reduced floral bud development, reduced bloom, and flower bud abscission. So there's four different things that happen as a result of a heavy crop. Secondly, the fruit impose, imposes impact on the next year's crop by the time of pit hardening in July. Third, crop management tools should be imposed by June. As I mentioned, we wanna avoid um, that flush of gibberellins going into the plant from pruning when floral development is taking place. So that's why we're suggesting pruning by about 28 days post bloom. Chemical thinning at fruit set is a tested option and some of the work um, by Bill Kruger, it's posted on my website, um, some of the chemical thin thinning um, uh, reports of his. Um, they've been in my Olive, Notes, um, my Olive Notes newsletters in the past. Um, and there are new studies underway looking at flower thinning. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge my um, collaborator, um, Dr. Carol Lovett at UC Riverside. She's a physiologist, so she brings all the plant growth regulator um, knowledge to the table. This work was funded by the California Olive Committee, and we've done this with, with excellent grower co cooperators such as Clarence Hill and Ishmael Gutierrez. Um, studies requiring crop destruct were all conducted at Lind Cove Research and Extension Center, and I'd like to acknowledge Tulare County UCCE and uh, Walter Martinez, our ag tech. 